Up next, we have Brian Pitts from Johnson Controls doing a session on facilitating developer adoption. Brian is, Brian is currently a Senior Director for Project Security at Johnson Controls. Brian previously worked at Honeywell as a Director of Product Security for its Safety and Productivity Solutions business. Prior to Honeywell, Brian completed a 28-year career in the U.S. Army where he served as signal, a signal officer. Brian has a master's degree in cybersecurity from the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. And Brian, I'll let you take it from here. All right. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for everybody for uh, taking a few minutes and uh, glad that you guys could join us um, just to have a quick uh, informative discussion about how um, what I've learned in my career to help drive uh, developer adoption. Um, it's uh, not an easy process and by no means something that we do um, very quickly or uh, easily, but I wanted to kind of share uh, my experience over the last uh, probably 10 years of my career of what I found that works well and some of the things that might be beneficial if you're um, starting an effort to really bring security to the forefront um, for your developers. So with that said, let me uh, let me just move over to our next slide and, and kind of walk you through it. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've worked at Johnson Controls really hard at is what we call a product, uh, secure product lifecycle. And um, what you'll notice is it's really two consec, uh, concentric circles, uh, kind of an infinity diagram that talks about our operations and how security kind of becomes uh, uh, a wrapper around those processes. And so if you look at it, um, we have spent a lot of time on the, what we would say the left side development process. And uh, there are eight, what we call eight key security activities that we ask our teams to do. And um, there's security, privacy, threat modeling, vendor assessment, software composition analysis, software and static analysis, assurance testing, and hardening guide. And all these activities um, are important to um, helping us develop secure code. And um, the other portion of this on the op side is what we have just undertaken a significant uh, refresh on is a discussion about how once we get the products to our customers, how do we deploy it? How do we make sure that it's patched? And how do we ensure that um, the best things are being done um, in the operational environment that we did our development? So um, this is a, a journey that we've undertaken over the last two years. Uh, we, we think this gets at the essence of uh, what really makes for a, uh, a successful, um, secure uh, development lifecycle. And, um, you know, there's lots of things that you can plug in to accomplish these activities. Um, but what's most important is helping get your um, developers actively understanding what these activities are. So let me uh, press on to the next slide here. Um, I want to go in a little bit of detail about what we do in the development cycle just to give you some context of what we work hard at. Um, we've got these eight, what we call eight developmental activities or security activities. Um, and we start at the very beginning with what we call security and privacy requirements. And this is where we've leaned very heavily on uh, security compass and uh, SD elements. Um, they really are the formative product that we use to help get that good set of requirements together as we work with our teams. Um, we've done a lot of work in our SDA, uh, SDE environment and done some customizations, special tasks. And um, we found that uh, it's really a great platform for being able to um, add our own flavor to things. We can change some of the, the values, but we still get the goodness of the hard work that Security Compass does in developing some of the, sta you know, the standards-based um, requirements. So really good marriage of the hard work of the Security Compass team and our teams here at Johnson Controls. Um, we quickly move into threat modeling um, to understand how the product's designed. We look at threats and vulnerabilities. Lots can be said about threat modeling. Um, in our in our context, one and two can can kind of go back and forth in an iterative effort. Uh, we find times when you know we may go back and visit requirements. We may uh, go back and iterate on threat modeling based on some things especially as the product design um, really starts to mature. Uh, so those are two ones that really get, get going very early in the process. 
Um, and then one of the big things we found um, is the importance of vendor assessments. Um, as you look at what you're going to use in the products, it's really important to understand where they're coming from and understanding what your third party suppliers are. So we, we have a, a tool, another tool that we use to really do um, some assessments of our vendors. Um, it's a really nice way to interact and engage with our, uh, our providers so that we understand what practices they're putting in place as they develop their products. So really a, a, a lot of good things happening in one through three. Um, when, once we get into four and five, um, this is really the core of the coding and building of our products. Um, this iterates, can iterate very quickly in a short sprint, you know, maybe two weeks, four weeks. But where you really gets interesting um, is coming back and having the tooling um, in the process, be sure to do a good feedback loop to the developer. So as most of you probably understand that we want to push left in our development processes, we want to give the tools as close to the developers we can so that um, we're fixing things as early as we can in the process. So um, we found that the composition analysis and stack analysis are really important tools that developers probably will interact with those two tools more than most uh, other elements of the process. Um, so having some really good uh, uh, definitive tools there is gonna be real important and good process. And you're always gonna be on a journey on these two, in my opinion, um, you, you get better at them. And um, I'll talk to you later about maybe some ways that you can do some uh, uh, some techniques to help uh, drive that a little bit. So um, the other part that uh, number six that we look at um, is what we call build materials capture. It's becoming really important uh, for us um, as a IOT uh, industrial IT provider um, in the building space to understand exactly what it went into the products as they went out the door, um, mainly because oftentimes we have to respond to product uh, vulnerability analysis after we release the market. So we need to understand if, if one of our providers tells us, hey, we've got an issue in a particular uh, radio or a particular piece of uh, open source code, we need to be able to understand where we have to make changes. And um, getting a good bill of material capture is a really a, a critical um, part of our process so that we can do that quick analysis and understand what our risk is to our customers. So um, bill of material, is really gonna be a, an important thing that we get done right and make sure that we're getting that captured as we go to market. Um, the other thing that we do a lot of at Johns Controls is um, doing some insurance testing. Well, we have team, uh, both internal and external that help us review the product in relation to how the product uh, met the requirements we asked it to. So all those things that we outlined and um, in, in number set, I mean, up in one and in, in, in four and to see four and five, um, we'll actually have our team go and say, hey, did they really accomplish that? So those are, uh, it's a really insightful step that's really, really important. Um, one of the things that we've also come to learn recently, um, the importance of is actually going back and looking at products that you may not be actively developing. Um, it's, we find that oftentimes something we may have done a year or two ago when we go back and look at it, hey, there's there's a new threat that we didn't understand, um, and we may have found uh, something new that we need to go back and address. So, really, a good uh, process to to go back and relook uh, your products that you've released in the last couple of years, and make sure that you're doing the uh, some active assurance testing. If uh, you're not, some people call this pen testing. We we call it a little more generic term called assurance testing. And then lastly, um, a big Big step for us is the development of what we call hardening guide. Um, other people, other parts of uh, businesses where I've worked have called it a security manual. But in essence, it's just a chance for us as a company to clearly articulate to our customers how best to employ the product. Um, you know, it may give them guidance on what kind of network it should be employed on, what are the best uh, security features that need to be running on, I guess, you know, on the OS. Um, the host OS, if, if, if it's a hosted piece of software. And uh, understanding that hardening guide is really important. And this is where we continue to work hard with our teams to really drive adoption of the uh, hardening guide as we, we service our customers and maybe some of our channel partners maybe um, putting the product in the market. So really um, 
an important uh, aspect that you need to take into account for when you're developing. Um, so those are kind of the highlights that we have um, from a product security uh, space uh, in our development. Um, I, you know, some other time if we'd like to, I'd love to come back and talk about what we do on the ops side, but really doesn't have as much impact to our developers. Um, and what, what we really want our development teams to know is, is really understand these eight tasks. I mean, we really want them, we want to be crisp, we want to be sharp, we want them to know that these are the things that they really need to get, um, get accomplished. So this kind of is the, the road that we drive on. These are the, the things that we're going to ask our development teams to do um, to one degree or another, maybe different people on the team, but um, these are the things that we're going to ask them to help us do to ensure the product's secure. All right, well, let me uh, move over to some, some fundamentals of what I think really helped drive adoption. And I've laid out here just um, from my experience, what I would say are eight key elements as you look to um, have a really uh, involved developer community related to your products. So um, I'm gonna kind of walk through each one of these. So I won't spend a ton of time here, but um, these are just my observations of um, the experience of trying to make it as easy as possible for our developers to embrace security as they work on our products. And there's, you know, you really have to understand what's at, at play. Um, and there's lots of things that you can do to help drive the experience for the customers. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, for our developers and really help them know what they need to do, when they need to do it and how to best do it. And I think a lot of these items really um, will enable you to accomplish that if, uh, if you can employ a lot of these principles. Uh, so let me, let me talk to you first about what I, when I talk about understanding our developers, we need to under, understand the environment they work in. So this is just a, um, a, a kind of a three-dimensional uh, picture here of some, of some different dimensions that you might want to consider when you look at your development teams. And I, I think you can do several different axes here. You could do lots of different, you could do a radar plot or you could, but in this case, I just pointed out three that I found to be really important um, when you understand your developers. And one of, the, one of the dimensions I like to look at is compliance. And a lot of this has to do with how well, um, how, how much control does your engineering management um, give to your development teams? Some are very restrictive. They only allow them to do X things in an X way. It's very prescriptive and you know, it requires them to act in a certain way. The, the opposite end of the spectrum is very permissive. Um, there's little guidance given oftentimes to teams. They're allowed to do whatever they want when they need to do it. They're allowed to use tools that they want. Um, and so you, you need to understand where they are on that spectrum um, because that'll drive a lot of how you wanna go about driving adoption. So understanding that is real important. Um, another element that you may want to think about is the experience level. Um, so you'll have the full spectrum, of course, of where your developers are on their life cycle of being a in their development career. You can certainly have folks that are right out of school. They need, uh, you know, they're really ready to be coached and they're easily uh, formed and they haven't maybe had some bad habits. Um, uh, and then you've got folks on the other end of the spectrum, very seasoned, lots of experience, um, well-versed in their technology. Um, you know, so here you, you'll have great folks who know their, their subject cold, but unfortunately, sometimes they develop bad habits. Like a lot of folks, um, you can get into a position where you, you really have not, are not aware of new technologies or maybe new ways to do that. So that's a really important dimension to understand. And then, the other dimension that you really want to look at is what technology platform are they developing on? Um, and we've run across this at Johnson Controls. We've got a lot of different technology uh, platforms that we develop on. Um, we've got some really new digital products that we have that are very contemporary. They use you know, the full tech stack of you know, uh, containerization, uh, micro segmentation. Um, you know, we've got APIs and very contemporary. And then we've got some legacy things that are still there that leverage, you know, Modbus and Serial and really old um, language uh, types from a developer space. So you've got to, under, you know, understanding where everyone is on this 
kind of multi-dimensional is really helpful when you go and say, how am I going to bring these teams along? So understanding that environment is really, really important. And um, it, it'll help set you up for success if you understand where your teams are. And like I said, you can have certain teams, you, you know, you don't treat your group as monolithic. Understand that with every team, uh, development team, uh, they may be in totally different spaces. We certainly have that at Johnson Controls, where some of our teams are, you know, more legacy, and then some are in digital, where they've got very contemporary, they're junior, they're, um, you know, they're very permissive. And we've got other teams that are restrictive, they're very senior, and they're working on very legacy stuff. So you can find, uh, in a company of our size, we find the entire breadth of, of uh, folks on that spectrum. So, and, uh, oh, by the way, if, if anyone has any questions, feel free to, uh, you can post them, I believe, here in the Q&A. And if, uh, if you want me to, if I see them come up, I'll try to answer them. But feel free if anyone has any of those, I'm happy to try to catch those as we go. All right. Um, Number two um, would be uh, what I would encourage folks to do is build a security champions program. Um, you know, this is the concept that, you know, a lot of folks have really embraced across the industry. Um, we, I've seen it done at Honeywell. Um, I've seen it done at other places, Cisco, to name a few that I've had some firsthand experience that we have one here at Johnson Controls. Um, we put a fair amount of effort into ours. Um, I think, you know, for our, we probably have 150 across our enterprise and um, we're really excited um, because what we try to do is really have a tiered program. And what we often do is we'll have a core group of security champions that are on, we try to have one on every development team that we, we really mentor and build a relationship with. Um, and over time, after some experience, I've got some of our requirements that we look for. Um, we try to move them up um, and make them have uh, greater accountability or more um, influence over their product line. And as they grow in their career, they, they may uh, have the opportunity to gain more responsibility for helping shepherd the security of their product or the product line. Um, the other thing, too, is we, we find that um, a lot of the folks that are in our champions program go on to be really good security architects and security practitioners that we actually bring on our team. So a lot of our folks um, were able to actually uh, make the transition from um, being a developer into being a security architect and um, really it's such a valuable skill when we have that. So um, I'm just, I got one question. I'm just trying to see if that makes sense. Yeah, I'll take a look at that. Let me get back to on that question here and I'll we'll see if we can get an answer for you. Um, let me, let's move. Uh, oh, the other thing too is make sure that your, your champions program um, has um, have some, in, some investment in it too. Don't, don't assume that you're going to be able to get um, champion. You know, it's, it's not as you got to invest in it. And the way we have been investing in ours is um uh, um, we, we facilitate some training for them and we pay for that out of the, the product security program. So it allows us to do that. Um, so it's a really good, um, good idea to, to make sure that you have some budget to support it. And I've, I got one question here. It says for security champions, are there given explicit times in the sprints to perform activities? Is it caught up in their sprint? Work? Hey, you know, it's a uh, great question. Um, you know, it's not always easy, um, you know, when you're trying to do an agile, you know, approach. Um, we I've seen teams do it in two different ways. Um, I've actually seen dedicated, almost like dedicated sprints just for security work. Um, my preference is, is to groom stories and assign them to the security champions based on what we get from um, SD elements. Um, our SD elements, what we've done in order to try to help facilitate that, we've integrated it with our AOM. Um, in our particular case, we use Jira. And so we'll, we'll get those tasks typically loaded in the backlog and groom them and then make sure they're the, in the appropriate sprint. So I hope that answers your question. But th there is a little bit of finesse there on getting that done well. Um, and every team kind of goes about it in a different manner. So I hope that answers the question for you. All right. Um, 
let's move on here. So let's see. Uh, the next thing that I would want to talk to you guys about is understanding what requirements are and what they aren't in the activities. And we, I've kind of alluded to this already. It's important to provide very clear guidance up front. And we've taken a three-tiered strategy for our policies and standards of work and treatment. So let me kind of walk you through um, how we do that. We at Johnson Controls really have two large policies that dictate um, how we do secure product development. Um, and that is um, something we work on every year. It gets updated annually and it's signed off by our, um, our, v, our actual vice president of our global products. And so it's it and it's it so it, there's a lot of weight behind it. Um, it's quite it's a light read. It's not overly prescriptive, but it's it really gives you the what and why. Here are the things we expect. It lists all those as you saw in the previous drawing in the beginning. It lists all those activities and says these things need to be done. And then what we do is underneath that policy, we write standards for each one of those activities. And the activities tell you how and when you need to do those activities. This is how you do it. This is how often or when you should do it in the process. Um, it gives you more clear guidance. We try to look at those on a quarterly basis. Um, we don't always have to make a change to those, um, but we want to review them and make sure that they're relevant given the context of, um, of our tooling and our new processes. So oftentimes that number, um, that quarterly update uh, may go, we may say, hey, there's not one this quarter, we may go another quarter before we update, but real important um, that we keep those standards up to date. Um, and then what we also use a lot is what we call our work instructions. And the work instructions um, are really uh, a big part of the, the detail execution of our, uh, of our process. So a lot of times these are unique to the tool or the procedure and they really walk a custom, I mean, one of our developers through the, the activity that we're asking them to perform. So real important to have those clear activities and requirements outlined. Um, the other, the, this kind of goes hand in hand with um, deploying effective tooling. Um, we, we really, there's really three states that we move things through. Um, there's implement, um, integrate, and assimilate. Um, what they're really, and what I call the, the kind of moving toward adoption, um, there's really these three states. And when you implement, um, that's usually the phase where you're really just trying to get the tool up and running in your environment. You're trying to get your, you know, your, uh, your developers, get the actual tool running. And this is very early stages. Um, it's, you know, it's probably a little bit uh, manual you have to upload code or you have to um, go into the tool in a web interface. So this is just in that early onset. And typically in our experience, this takes three or four months for us to get a tool up to get it up and running and fully integrated in our environment. Um, and then that moves into our integration. Now integrated in our environment, we really strive to do is um, automated into our different CI CD processes. And this allows us to use it to allow as builds develop that they can run these things um, automatically as part of a build process like in Jenkins. And then it may, um, based on the results, it may break the build or it may do something different. So that's kind of a, a big part of this is that integration. And then lastly, we, we strive to kind of really assimilate it into our, our whole risk management framework. And Truthfully, we, we're still evolving into this third phase of our process in getting all of our capabilities fully assimilated into our risk management framework. And um, this is the capability to understand exactly what um, the tool found, how we dispositioned it, how does it actually complement other tools. And um, that it's a level of complexity that's not easy to get to, um, but it's the idea that all the tooling provides a single integrated risk picture of what your product has. And uh, we're, we're just, yeah, John's Control is really working hard to get um, that last phase of our process working. Uh, we've had some success, but uh, we're always striving to really build out that assimilate um, portion of our adoption. So, all right. So that's um, kind of how we look at tooling. Um, 
And it's it's kind of appropriate as as we look at tooling to talk about how do we how do we you should measure your maturity. And you know, there's the CMMM model that a lot of folks use um, out of Carnegie Mellon, and you know, different states you can go through. Um, I, we we just use kind of a, a level a four level methodology, um, and we try to we try to look at our businesses um, that we support in this construct. Um, we haven't we haven't fully adopted this completely, but we we're, where we're seeing it used, it's very helpful to understand like. It kind of give you a gauge of where your development teams are on how well they're buying into your activities and your tools and your process. And so you know, most folks, you know, if you're if you got a brand new program, you know, you just don't have the tools and the process, you know, you're going to be at a level zero. Um, level one is much like we talked about with the tooling. It's then that implement stage. You're just trying to get the tools up and running. You're just trying to get developers in the tools, getting familiar with it. But uh, you, you only have a handful, and so that's that level one is kind of a, kind of an ad hoc process. And but you've got them. Um, level two is where you've got the tools and the process are implemented. But you you're what we find is is we may be using um, a lesser um, benchmark in the tool to help uh, coax the team along. And what what we always joke at our um, at GCI is that there's an old analogy about how you cook frogs that I got told when I was a little boy here in the South is you don't throw a frog into the, the hot pot or he'll jump out. But if you put the frog in and then you tur slowly turn the heat up before he knows that you've got frog legs. So what the method out of that madness of that story is, is that we want to kind of slowly turn um, the benchmark up on our teams. And so as they get more comfortable with the tools, we start ratcheting up the, the 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 benchmark about what we want them to close because you don't want to as you look at maturity you don't want the tools to be so the first time they go in and you know we find a thousand vulnerabilities or five hundred um, you know you're going to scare away so we we really want to start um, with a, the bar maybe a little bit lower and then as we get time we may turn that that ratchet that that bar up, if you kind of think about it, kind of turning the heat up on the frog. So uh, not that we uh, we love our developers, but um, you know that's kind of a good methodology to understand as you kind of turn that heat up on them and do that. So as you get for, you know, further along, you know, your tools are fully implemented, you've got full compliance, all of your teams are really embracing the tool. Um, you're, you've got your, you've turned the bar up as high as you can. And then level four is really where you've got that, what I call that assimilate, your, your tools are integrated, your processes are integrated, you're seeing the full picture, you're able to continue to improve the process, you're really sustaining at that point. Um, and that, you know, that's a hard place to get and definitely hard, even harder to stay there with all the new technologies and threats that evolve. So, um, but that's that's kind of a, a maturity model you may wanna use. Um, you certainly can adopt that or adapt that to, to help you as you move forward in a, you know, understanding how to get tools to work for your developers and understand how well they're adopting uh, the tools. Um, the other part that we we spend a lot of energy on is engaging our engineering and development management, management uh, excuse me, development managers. So we we really break ours into three big groups. Um, we have executive engagement with our with our our what we call our exec, our executive committee. Those are folks who report to our CEO. Uh, we meet with them uh, once a quarter. We talk about trends. We talk about where we're headed from uh, regulatory and compliance issues related to our products. What are the big trends that we're trying to dive, uh, drive? Um, if that's source code repository um, management, if it's um, anything that's a large effort that we're going to need, you know, the executive leadership team to really buy into. So we try to do that once a quarter. We we found that to be a good cadence um, for our uh, for our program here at JCI. And then our business unit uh, leader engagement, we, we do that on a monthly basis typically. Um, and we run um, a small uh, security council in each one of our business units and our product security leaders for each of our businesses and our security architects kind of facilitate that. Um, and they look at you know tooling, how it's being adopted, what are issues we're running across with our teams. So that those are the two places where we engage with leadership, and then um, our ad hoc engagements are 
Um, we take every opportunity to, to, you know, using different mediums to talk to our uh, developers. And we've got a couple of different forms we do that in. We have a software security group that we meet uh, every two weeks. We try to talk about things that need to be improved and new trends we're seeing. And we use that as a forum for our uh, some of our security champions to come back and give us feedback. And uh, matter of fact, I was just on a call this morning talking about the importance of certain password links. Um, and I had I was having a discussion with our service managers about, you know, sometimes they're like, hey, what's the difference between eight and 12 uh, character passwords? And, you know, it's really interesting, uh, the education we have to do sometimes is like how, how big a difference there is between an eight and a 12 character password. Um, you know, how much, uh, you know, how much more difficult it is for folks to break uh, those longer passwords. Now, passwords in themselves aren't perfect. Um, we know that you can use other technologies to do that, but just that one small thing um, makes a big difference. And so we kind of try to explain that there is some thought to the requirements that we generate. So we want to leverage every opportunity to educate our engineering, man in engineering and development managers. So real important to do that. Um, so the other part that's really important that we found is um, enable um, security training. Um, we've got a great team at JCI. We have two folks on the team that really help with this. Um, we leverage um, a, a, an online platform called Pluralsight. Uh, it's a really good platform. It's got a lot of great security content, but you know, Security Compass has a platform that does this. Um, there's lots of uh, different places you can go to get, um, get good cybersecurity training on demand and, and they can be self-paced. And we actually create channels in our uh, platform and we require that our security champions go through those uh, channels and get, you know, show their competency. We have some requirements for them to do that. And uh, we kind of monitor where they are on progressing. Um, so there's lots of ways you can do that, but we actually pay for that for our security champions out of our program and price security. But we, we're working hard to encourage our uh, development teams to actually fund um, those licenses for the rest of the team because there's not only good security content out there, there's also great, um, just good training related to technical uh, uh, knowledge. So we, we also find that technically um, smart people typically implement the code correctly and therefore usually quality code is secure code. So we, we think there's a good correlation. So we're always an advocate for, for training. Um, we always get questioned how much time should we ask our teams to do? Um, you know, we've kind of gone back and forth. Um, you know, we've seen some folks who say, hey, maybe we ought to have 40 hours a year dedicated to security training for developers. Um, I don't know that there's a right answer, but boy, that sure does feel right to me for, you know, maybe somebody even say two weeks. I don't, I don't know where the right answer is, um, but it's somewhere in that area. And it's a, it's a huge investment um, if we can get that level of commitment to do some training for our developer. And they want it typically. We you usually will find developers hungry to get better training in this environment. They want to know because it makes them a better developer. So usually that's a not a hard sell to the development team. It's usually a little more of a sell to their the management team that wants them writing features sometimes. So a little bit of tension normally exists there. Um, the other thing that we found some success with or, or we're, we're really dabbling with that I think with, it's a really interesting construct is the idea of kind of doing a hybrid um, training model where um, we we meet uh, for like a week and we do uh, modules together online. So what we might do is within our platform say, okay, we're going to take this class and then uh, for 30 minutes after the class, everybody gets together and we kind of go through some content uh, together and say, hey, what did we what did we learn out of that? How can we apply it to Johnson Controls, how we could do that. So we're, we're, we're starting to experiment and kind of dabble in how that format works. Um, we're actually gonna use it um, for an upcoming CSSLP class that we're, we're gonna do this summer. We're gonna pilot with our, our product security team. So, um, but I think this is a pretty novel approach instead of, especially under COVID and things like that, it's a neat way to do that. So something uh, that you may find useful and um, it's really good for when you're doing, um, when you got a lot of people in different places and you want to have um, have a good interaction. So um, in the, all of our conference tool, I mean, our collaboration tools now, Teams and Slack and all that, 
they really make that pretty effective, uh, pretty easy to do now. And then the last one, you know, where we do these fully immersive um, training, there's there's lots of great, great tools where you can do. Uh, we've been talking to a uh, to a company that does uh, like product security incident response. Um, I got to set through one with IBM one time where you're like actually in a sock and. Um, and it's, it's pretty neat when you're kind of immersed in it and it's as if you're role playing um, your role in a real time scenario um, can be quite, uh, quite, quite a pressure cooker and make you kind of feel sweat a little bit. Um, certainly my experience in the military says that's really good training um, and not easy to pull off in a virtual environment, but something that is worthwhile um, as you work through things like product security incident response. Um, and having developers understand the pressure you're under. And um, it's also helpful sometimes for developers to see how threat actors um, work against their product. Um, so sometimes um, you can actually um, allow your um, developers to participate um, and watch a, uh, a red team kind of take on their product and, and get watch over their shoulders. And say, Gosh, I never thought about exploiting uh, you know, feature that they developed in a certain way and kind of misusing it, not, not the way they intended. So lots of good things. And of course, we, we always want to encourage, you know, the academic development, go into work on your uh, degree program as, you know, and progress um, academically. I mean, that's always a good thing. Not, per, not a perfect thing, but by far, we want to encourage um, that full spectrum of security training across that. So lots of things there that you can use. Um, and so what I, the last thing I want to talk to you about is how, how we communicate to our, um, our developers. And there's lots of forums by which you can get this done. Um, we're an O365 shop at, in my, at, here at a Johnson Controls. So you'll see that we kind of bend toward the Microsoft uh, suite, but there's all the other you know, venues you can do this on. But we, we, we aggressively try to market to our developers through our our Yammer channel that we have. We, we have an all company Yammer channel that we publish training on in events. And then um, we also have a dedicated team channel, uh, team for our business unit security champions so they can communicate and talk with each other. This is not always easy. There's lots going on and you know having someone really work to facilitate it's really important. Um, we have teams channels dedicated to our tools and um, like GitHub and, and different products that we use so that teams can try to work together and have lessons learned. Um, we really prefer people not develop things on their own. If they can learn from someone else who did it before, chances are we've looked at it and, hey, that's that's a good best practice. We ought to do it that way. Um, another thing we do at Jobs Controls that's, um, that's kind of fun, we do a monthly product security podcast where uh, myself and a few of our, the architects get together and we talk about what's going on in the market what things we're seeing as threat, uh, threat vectors. And we kind of take about, you know, 15 uh, minutes and it's very, you know, very, uh, very informal. And we just kind of talk through what we're seeing. We try to publish that monthly. And then lastly, you know, we, we definitely leverage, you know, standard email communications that our, our communications team publishes. And we try to um, insert ourselves into those messages as often as we can to make sure folks get that. So those are kind of some of the highlights of what, my experience has been in providing uh, some direction to our developers. Um, so I would be happy to take questions or comments. I hope you found that um, a little bit uh, insightful. By no means uh, is, it the, is it the perfect answer, but it's just um, what I've learned over the last 10 years of trying to help developers um, do the right thing. So be happy to take any questions. Okay. Well, um, I don't see any more questions, so I, I think we can probably uh, have a, give everybody back a little bit of their time and um, feel free. I um, assume we can reach out to Secure Compass. And of course, if you're interested in talking with me directly, I'm on LinkedIn and feel free to uh, look for me, Brian. I think it says Brian P. if you're not already connected to me, but feel free to reach out. And um, if you want to have a conversation on the side, I'd be 
more than happy in our security community to share our best practices and, uh, and all that. So I think with that said, I think we can wrap up. Lauren, did it, Laura, did you have anything before we close? No, I think we're all good. If there's no further questions, thank you so much for this. It was extremely helpful. I was furiously writing down notes. So thank you so much for together. Um, I know that everyone took a ton away from that. So thanks so much. No worries. Great. I'm glad, I'm glad uh, we got some value from it. So, all right. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good one, everyone.